Okay, so here's our biofuel production lecture. Let me put this in here. Base part two of the lecture on biofuels. So look at just the general process. And this is why I'm doing this after we've done cellular respiration and photosynthesis. Those two pathways are linked. So solar energy goes to what they're calling feedstock in this image. That is your producer. It could be your corn, your canola, your cane, your uh, cellulose. It, it's being explored with algaes, with anything that's photosynthetic, using sunlight to grow that organism, their producers. There's a physical pretreatment with different chemicals and enzymes, and that's what I mentioned in the previous lecture, understanding which enzymes convert that product, that cellulose, whatever product it is, that carbohydrate, digestion of the carbohydrate down into a simple sugar, a monosaccharide, and those sugars then go to, as they're calling them, fuel-producing microorganisms, bacteria, yeast, various fungi. Again, possibility may be we find a protestin that can do this and we force them into an anaerobic environment. We do not give them the oxygen to do aerobic. Instead, we run, or they run anaerobic, and this is what's driving the production of the alcohol, ethanol primarily. It's fermentation is what we're doing here, and those are the things we're calling the biofuels. Okay, so what we want to look at now is a comparison, a general comparison. These numbers are changing. They're not static, they're constantly changing, and there are lots and lots of variables associated with this. But what we want to look at is kind of the general picture to then hopefully make smart decisions as we move forward with energy production, how do we vote, what do we decide on in regards to energy production. Okay, so let's run through corn. We'll do the input and the output in corn. You know, how much energy does it take to grow it, to harvest it, and then once it's turned into biofuel, what kind of energy output do you have? All right, so here goes. So for corn, every one unit that goes in will net you 1.3 units coming out. So you gain. You, you, there's a positive gain, a 0.3 energy output gain. So Again, one going in, 1.3 coming out. Uh, the gas prices, obviously, these will fluctuate and change daily. We can see gas prices changing daily. But when gas was running $3.03 a gallon, the comparable ethanol price to get equal mileage, mind you, this is the key because it's not as efficient. So if you run E85, it's a lot cheaper at the pump, but you don't get the same miles per gallon. So the equal mileage running in ethanol fuel was $3.71. Again, that's not buying a gallon of gas versus a gallon of eth ethanol. It was to go, if you were driving 100 miles with gas and 100 miles with ethanol, unfortunately, at the consumer side of it, it's more expensive to purchase ethanol. So that definitely deters people from why do I want to pay more to drive my car? Why would I support ethanol? The other side of it, when we look at greenhouse emissions, gasoline produces or was producing 20.4 pounds of emissions per gallon. Now when we look at ethanol, ethanol produced 16.2 pounds of emission per gallon. So it's actually 22% less on the greenhouse emissions side. So environmentally, big benefit there. I mean, that's that's a big benefit when you're looking at burning of gasoline versus burning of ethanol. Now, what it doesn't factor in, and this has to be considered, but it also has to be considered on the fossil fuel side, what amount of greenhouse emissions were produced to make that gasoline. You know, this 20.4 versus 16.2 is simply in my vehicle driving to and from work. But to input that corn into the ground, I burned a lot of fuel. To get it out of the ground, to harvest it, to process it, I'm producing emissions. The same thing can be said for fossil fuels. 
to get the fossil fuels out of the ground through the emission cost. There's input energy, there's et cetera, there's fossil fuels produced or greenhouse emissions produced when we're transporting rail cars full of coal or tankers of oil and gasoline. So, so all things to consider. So it's not a real simple, easy call here, but we want to look at just some of the general information. Okay, now if we go down to Kane, one unit energy in, Kane nets you eight units of energy on the output huge increase compared to corn. But we were talking in the last lecture, our limitation on cane is the fact that we can't grow a lot of cane in the Midwest. We could go to southern United States, southeast, go to Florida, Louisiana, maybe parts of Texas, possibly run cane down there. So again, the idea is, can we diversify? Price-wise, $4.91 per gallon for gas, If and this is Brazil price, because this is really the primary place that's using cane. The ethanol price in the same market was $3.88. As a consumer, I like that. I want to buy cheaper gas or cheaper fuel. Ethanol is my thing if I am in an area where this is available. It's a lot cheaper than gasoline. <clears throat> but now we also want to look at the environmental side. 20.4 pounds of emissions per gallon with the gasoline. And the ethanol, 9 pounds of emissions per gallon with the ethanol. Significant difference when we're looking at uh, greenhouse emissions. 56% less on the greenhouse emissions side of things. I mean, that's pretty cool. But, again, our struggle, can't really do cane in the United States across the board. It can be done in selective areas. So do we want to explore that? In more detail. Uh, biodiesel in Germany, one unit in, 2.5 units out. Not that exciting as cane, but more exciting than corn. Uh, Price-wise, again, German prices, $6.15 per gallon of regular gas. Biodiesel, $6.73. Oop, 73. So not the most exciting thing when we talk about cost. That's the problem with biodiesel. On the emission side, diesel fuel, 23.4 pounds of emissions per gallon. Diesel, if we do the comparable biodiesel with canola in Germany, only 7.6 pounds per gallon on the, oops, gallon, per gallon on the greenhouse emissions side. So 68% less on the greenhouse emissions side. Huge environmental reason to do biodiesel, but not a consumer reason. Not a consumer reason to say, hey, I'm going to spend more for this ethanol-based fuel source, even though it is environmentally beneficial. Okay, last one to take a look at is the cellulose. Okay, so cellulose is a wild card right now. There's this huge spectrum. It's still in the exploratory stages. Um, nobody's really locked in what is the best source of cellulose. Lots and lots of different research. This is why I'm encouraging you guys, if you're interested in this, it's a great time to get into it. There are a lot of biological concepts and things to sort out and figure out, but also a lot of social, political, environmental, etc. So unbelievably complex issue but a very exciting one where you could make a name for yourselves and go here's we got it we got it figured out here's the ideal plant that is the best across the board with this type of production so all right so one unit of energy in depending upon the type of cellulose used it can net anywhere from two to 36 units in a return Two doesn't sound that exciting. It's better than corn, though. Even on the lowest end, cellulose is better than corn. But imagine that high end. It's like, holy cow, 36 units output. That is phenomenal. That's four times better than cane. And cellulose can be grown some, almost anywhere. I mean, you could use poor ground, ground that's not really good for anything else, and grow cellulose on it and use that and get massive return of energy on it. 
Um, the retail price per gallon, we don't have any comparison because it's not in the market at this point. There's not a strong enough push or large enough support to get cellulose into the market yet. But we can look at the, the greenhouse side of it, the emissions. So gasoline, 20.4 pounds per gallon. When we talk about gas emissions, cellulose emissions are usually only about 1.9 pounds per nine pounds per per gallon I mean that is phenomenal it's a 91 percent less on the greenhouse gas emissions side of things I mean that is unbelievably valuable you know we talked about biodiesel being 68 percent that's huge 91 percent that could make a phenomenal difference environmentally if we could get enough of a movement and support for the cellulose side of ethanol production. So it takes people with the passion, with the interest, with the ability to move this forward, and it takes the voters. Could you convince voters, hey, switch over? Um, I think the bottom line that convinces most voters in today's world is dollars. Is this going to be cheaper when we buy a gallon of ethanol produced by cellulose versus a dollar of gasoline. There's all those other variables in there. The environmental side, does this help politically to move us away from dependence on foreign oil, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's so many different variables in there that they all have to be considered and they all play a role. But can we move in this direction? Is this the ideal direction that we want to go with ethanol production or biofuel production? Okay, so what I want you guys to do is pull together photosynthesis and cellular respiration. Here's photosynthesis. Here's cellular respiration. It just happens to be the anaerobic version. Imagine if we could use the aerobic version and somehow get that to produce ethanol or a fuel source for us. That could be phenomenal because the massive amount of ATP produced during aerobic versus anaerobic. But tie those two concepts together and look at how this works for us to be able to produce these types of fuels. So when we look at the aerobic respiration or anaerobic respiration, there are alternative energy sources. You, know, you, you can run glucose through the pathway. Here's our respiration. If we go straight down, we're doing aerobic. It gives us a huge return of ATP. Generally 36 ATP is what we say we get out of this. But if glucose is not available, we can use fats, run fats through the pathway and get a return. We can also use proteins, run them through the pathway and get a return. The concern with either of these other pathways is what happens to the byproducts produced when we're running through the, um, the cellular respiration pathway using fats or using proteins. You know, with fats, generally glycerol gets broken down completely. The fatty acids get broken down, but you yield massive amounts of ATP, which superficially sounds great, but that's not the healthiest for us. The high protein diet, I'm going to use proteins to make ATP because I'm on Atkins or South Beach or these, these different ideas, eating habits. The amino acids get broken down. They go through the pathway to give us ATP. They give us about the same as what we get from glucose, but this is a concern when you're dealing with the uh, protein conversion during cellular respiration. This thing called deamination when you're producing ammonium. That's got to go through your kidneys. It's got to filter through the body, through the kidneys, and then be excreted. Small amounts, not going to be a big deal. Our body's going to be able to tackle that. But if you're doing this on a consistent basis and you push into what we call it, Acid, or acid ketosis, that starts causing some problems for your body. And that's not a healthy thing for your kidneys to be going through as this deamination process and this amount of ammonium is being created, pushed through the kidneys, filtered, and then excreted. So all of these things can be used for energy. Optimally, we want to run glucose through the pathway because it yields the most in the best way, and that is the primary purpose of the carbohydrates, is to use them as a source, a primary source of energy. So again, tie together photosynthesis and cellular respiration. 
how those two pathways are linked be very important as we get into our further into this unit.